Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you uh, finished off all the cookies. Otherwise, I'm going to take them home. Uh, and journalists like nothing more than free food and, obviously, later, free booze. Um, now, uh, we're going to move on very quickly. We're a little bit behind schedule. Before we get on, though, just to remind everybody, please do submit questions. All the details of how to do it up there. In fact, as I saw from the app as we were doing our polls, I think you can also just push the button next to it and submit questions that way. Uh, so please get them ready for uh, the panel in an hour or so. So let's hand over, though. Everyone wants to hear about the US, and who better to hear it from than a Frenchman working for a French bank? Uh, Thomas Julien from the Texas. Come on up. I agree. With, that's quite unusual. Um, so but thanks for uh, COFAS for inviting me. I'm really looking forward for next year, because they're going to invite me again, and it's going to be in Miami, apparently. <laughs> so this is going to be great. Um, the, the question we all ask ourselves, I think, in, in consciously or unconsciously, is where are we in the cycle in the US? That's what I want to talk about today. So the, the presentation will be divided into three parts. First, we're going to see what are the prospects, economic prospects for this year, in terms of growth forecasts, the primary, what will be the primary drivers of growth, maybe talk a bit about what will be the impact of, uh, of the tax changes. And, uh, and then also a word on the risk. And then, but the, the core of the pre presentation will be really about finding out where are we in the cycle, uh, are we at full employment, and what are the consequences, and also when could be the next recession. And the last part is going to be about inflation. Why are, aren't we seeing more inflation today, and, and what the Fed will do, because I think if I listen to the previous participation, participant, um, the Fed tightening cycle was mentioned as a risk for either for the global outlook or for the rest of the world. Um, so this is just a slide. I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to skip some. Um, starting with this, I think uh, Julien already showed this slide with the, the world. This, I like to look at the ISM manufacturing. It's a survey, it's a business survey that we have in the US. It tells you it has very few predicting power, but it's, it's a good indicator of where we are now. And if you look at the level of, uh, of the ISM, so I combine the ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing, and it tells you that uh, where real growth is in the US and it should be close to 3%, so it's a good indicator. Even though you had a slight decline in, uh, in business surveys recently, it still tells you that the growth environment is good. Um, turning to our forecast, we see growth accelerating this year uh, from 2.3% to 2.6%. This is above what we think is a potential growth in the US, so it's a strong growth environment. It's mainly due to the tax changes. Uh, if you want to forecast the US economy, 70% uh, of uh, growth in the US is consumption, so if you get consumption right, they usually, uh, you'll usually uh, have a good idea of where growth will be. So growth, of course, will, consumption will be driven by uh, the ongoing recovery on the employment market, so with strong job gains, and also slightly, we'll go back to that later, but slightly stronger wages. Uh, and one of the main factors that will push consumption also is tax cuts. Uh, so you can see that it's uh, summarize the table. Given the recent increase in oil prices, I may, uh, this forecast may, be, may need to be revised slightly lower. Another important question is what will CapEx do in the US? Um, so the, I'm saying that because we have someone from Bank de France here. They just released a paper saying that if you are an honest economist, you need to look at the share of investment. You need to look at the net share of investment and not the real investment rate like I did uh, here, you need to take out uh, depreciation um, if you want to be honest. So this chart is just showing you the share of investment into GDP in the US. The net share is slightly lower, but it's still very high now. So it's just to tell you that um, can in CapEx grow further? It's a good question, and it's, uh, it's already very high in the US. So the Survey on the right is telling you what, uh, it's a survey made by the Fed of Atlanta, I think, and we are asking companies what they will do with the tax cuts, and 75% of them are saying that is, they haven't changed their, their CapEx plan 
we are following the tax reform. So it's a, it's a good question, but we don't think that there will be a lot of a lot more investment in the U.S. Uh, this year. And um, another very important consequence of the of the tax reform is uh, it's uh, I will uh, develop further after is when you are at full employment in the U.S. What's supposed to happen is that the trade deficit will go wider and it will not narrow. So that's uh, something to, to expect this year. Um, turning to the next part of my presentation, um, I have a quick question for you, if you can answer that. Yeah, 50s. Uh, so 70 percent. Two thirds of, of you think that uh, we are not at full employment, which is not my view. So I will try to convince you. <laughs> uh, so when you think about the U.S. economy, uh, you can see that now we have closed the output gap. I think you you've shown the same thing on your chart. Pretty obvious. But now is the the U.S. economy is very close to its full capacity, looking at this. But what we are re really looking at is the labor market. And on this chart, this chart is showing you two things. It's showing you, so the purple line is a regular uh, unemployment rate. And then what we, look li we, we like to look at is a wider measure of unemployment rate, which is what U6. So it's the regular unemployment rate to which you add also discourage workers, and also people working, work, working part-time but who would like to work more. And you can see that if you look at both measures, you're really, uh, you're really below your long-term level. It, it tells you that there's, uh, um, the, the slack on the labor market is, uh, has gone away pretty much. Huh? Of course, if you're like Anthony and you, you read Breitbart, they're telling you that the unemployment rate is at 37%. Uh, this is another view. Uh, the, very important question, I think, is that's why a lot of you answer that we are not at full employment, is the United States, is that the participation rate is still fairly low in the U.S., and there may be more room to grow. What we look at is the prime age, so you define prime age by people in between 25 and 54 years old, and you can see that the participation rate for them is moving higher, which is a good sign. Um, also, you have a, a very high participation rate. It's striking when you are from France. Huh? I'm supposed to give the French view here. Looking at the participation rate for people 65 years and over, it's close to 20% in the US. In France, it's close to, uh, it's less than 4%. That's very different. But uh, no, keep in mind that if you, if you uh, it's a really important question whether or not we are at, for your growth outlook, whether or not we are at full employment in the, in the US. Um, what, what, um, why I'm saying that we are at full employment is because when I look at different indicators, you can see that it's hard to find some labor. Um, the first chart, the chart on the left, is a chart. It's a, another survey done by the BLS. It shows the number of new openings. And the other line is showing the hiring. So you can see that there's much more openings than hiring right now in the US. And it's meaning that corporates are having a hard time finding, finding labor. And the other chart is very uh, interesting as well. So it's a six month average, except the last point. I wanted to emphasize the trend. So you can see it's uh, the NFIB. It's a survey for small businesses. And they're asking small businesses what, what is their most important problem. You can see that it used to be taxes a lot. Uh, during the crisis, it was demand, so poor sales, and also red tape. You can see that the administration did very good in cutting taxes and also cutting red tape, so regulation. And but now that the most important problem is the quality of labor and the quantity of labor. So it's the red line, and then you have the, uh, the cost of labor also, which starts to be a problem. 
it's rising, it's uh, the last line, but if you combine both the red line and the last dotted line, it tells you that lab labor is the single most important problem for, for uh, small businesses now. It's meaning that it's very hard to, uh, to, find, uh, to find qualified labor in the US. Um, so if you are at full employment, what's supposed to happen to employment growth? It's supposed to slow down, not accelerate like it did in the past. Uh, this chart is just showing you the monthly pace of job creation in the US. Uh, it was accelerating recently. The red line is the number of job creations you need per month to make the unemployment rate decline. And you can see that the six month or the three month trend in job creation is close to 200,000. It's way more what we need to, uh, to make the unemployment rate shrink further. Um, when you are at full employment, it means that your supply is constrained. There's not so much you can produce. Uh, and it, it means that it's usually what happened during a late cycle. You, uh, you need to import what you can't produce. Your demand is increasing sharply, but there is not there's a certain, uh, what you can produce is limited. And so what happened, you need to, you need to buy uh, what you what you want to consume abroad. So this is technically what what's going on. Once again, three way we could be wrong in our scenario is then if you see a meaningful rebound in the participation rate, that could mean that you could attract much more people on the labor force and mean you can produce more. You can get more immigration. I'm not sure that's happening in the, in the U.S. And the other way you could produce more with the, with the same, uh, same quantities by making gain, the same quantity of labor is by making meaningful productivity gains. And that's also something that's, uh, that we need to see that's quite unlikely. Now I wanted to talk, uh, to review with you uh, the mortality rate of the, of the, of, uh, the past cycle. So this is the next question. When do you think when do you expect the next recession? It's funny because this morning the Wall Street Journal did the exact same, uh, asked the exact same question. So I'm going to tell you how you compare with the average uh, Wall Street Journal uh, correspondent. Uh, so they, basically, it's consistent with the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Uh, 60% of the correspondents say they were expecting the next recession in 2020. And so you are actually more optimistic than the, than the average Wall Street Journal reader. Um, what you see this year and next year is consistent with what we think. You look at pretty much all the probability of recession should be close to 10 to 15% that you usually see. Um, the question when we see clients and we're asking when will be the end of the, of the cycle, because it's been a very long cycle in the US. It's not the longest on record. The longest on record was 10 years, I think. Now we are getting close to nine years. So you're saying that on average, a cycle in the US is five to six years. So we, we, we are way past this point. So when is the, when is the next recession? Uh, actually, if you look at this economic cycle, it's very, it's a very unusual cycle. It's been very slow. So this chart is showing you on the left side, it's a real GDP, but you put basis 100 one quarter before the recession. And then you see how it changes. And you do the same thing for employment. And you can see how slow the recovery was in the US. It's probably one of the reasons why this, this cycle is so stretched out. Uh, now, if you want to see a recession in the U.S., you need to look at uh, what, what could cause uh, a recession uh, in the near term. Uh, what I like to look at is imbalances, how leverage has evolved in the past few years. And you can see that if you look at households, it's still going down or stabilizing. The real, uh, I think, where you see some kind of leverage is on the go federal government side. 
And maybe we'll see that later. We, you don't see that much here on this chart, but uh, non-financial corporates also have re-leverage quite a bit. So speaking about household, we are not that worried about leverage from the household uh, sector. Uh, you look at household debt in nominal, it's very elevated today, but what you need to look at is uh, the share of uh, debt compared to the disposable income, and then if you do that, you can see that it's, uh, it's gone down a lot. Um, you, especially for mortgages, which is the biggest, uh, biggest share for uh, mortgage debt, it's still, uh, that's the purple line on the chart on the left, it's still very low, and then you see that leverage has gone up for student loans and auto loans. Uh, auto loans is different, it has nothing to do with, there's no exposure of the financial sectors on, uh, on, uh, for student loan, so the risk is, uh, is limited. And as you know, you cannot default on a student loan, so it's very different from a home. On a home, you can, uh, you can default, but not on student loan. So you have a bit of excess leverage for, uh, for cars, but you look at total leverage for households is not that elevated. There is absolutely nothing like uh, 2007. You look at how much households are paying in, in, uh, in terms of interest payments, it's very low today. So even if rates are rising, what the households pay as interest is still very, very low, so very manageable. And also what's something that did not come back is there is no more home equity revolving, meaning household do not use their home as a collateral to consume more. Now the story is a bit different from the financial sector. Financial sector, the leverage went, went back up quite uh, close to where it was before the, before the crisis. Uh, but uh, it's the same story here. What uh, the interest payment for the same amount of debt since interest rates are lower, uh, interest payments are, are lower, more manageable. Financial conditions, even though the Fed is tightening, still quite accommodative. It's not going up dramatically. Uh, if you look at the last senior loan officer survey, you can see that financial conditions are, are deteriorating because the Fed is tightening. But at the same time, you have banks that are loosening, still easing their credit standards. So that's kind of offset uh, the, the, this trend. Um, we look a lot at the profit, the share of profit into GDP. It's a good predictor of crisis. If you make a model, if you want to forecast a recession, and you can see that it's, it's pretty much stable. It's, if you think about it, it's a, very, it's a very unusual cycle. You are at a point in the recovery at which labor is getting more expensive for your comp corporates. The cost of debt also is getting more expensive. So what's supposed to, uh, to happen is that you get tighter margin unless you can increase your consumer prices, which is not happening. But at the same time, you have the, a massive uh, fiscal stimulus with a cut in taxes, which means that this is going to offset the rise in the, in the cost of labor and the cost of, uh, the cost of taxes. Um, looking at the risk, I think you, Julien mentioned that also. The, there's no, no bankruptcies in the US. Huh? It's, uh, the r default rate is very low. So once again, it's a very, very unusual cycle in which, uh, in which you, are, uh, the, you stimulate the economy at full employment and you can keep alive your, your companies. Um, this chart is just, I wanted to talk about the death of Schumpeter. I will not talk too, too much about that. It relates to the zombie, uh, zombie film um, story that Julian mentioned. Um, when you, uh, you, have, you have a lot of productivity gains in, uh, in, in the US, but uh, what's going on is that the firms that are the least productive are not dying. <laughs> That's technically what happened, is because in part with, because monetary policy is very loose and also uh, because you have a stimulative uh, fiscal uh, tax cuts. Uh, just, so we basically think that the risk of recession today is very, uh, is very low. Um, in this chart, I wanted to compare what an average post-World War II recession looks like compared to the last financial crisis. Uh, you can see that it's very, very different. So 
the last financial crisis was probably uh, was probably the kind of crisis that you see once in a century, and uh, and the next recession will probably look a lot different from uh, from what we had in in 2007. Now, I wanted to turn to inflation by asking you this question. Okay, we have 56. So for this one, I will not have to convince you because I also think inflation will be, uh, will be between 2 and 3%. Uh, and 3%. Uh, no, first of all, I, uh, we were discussing this with Anthony. When you talk about inflation, it depends what you talk about. So I just had, uh, I have uh, three kids now. I just had twins. So when I look at the inflation intuition, I'm wondering whether or not I... I will have to go back to France uh, to, uh, for the education of my kid. Uh, but here is the puzzle. So what's going on is that there's supposed to be a trade-off for the Fed between inflation and the employment market. Um, that's basically when the unemployment rate is going down, you're supposed to see more pressure on prices coming from, uh, from wages mostly, because wages are the determinant of the trend in inflation. And you don't see that today. So I... I here is a list of what could be some explanation for why inflation isn't, isn't higher today. Uh, first, technical factors, I will not talk too much about that. It was more last year when we had the temporary decline in the price of telecommunication. This was because when you look at inflation, you look at the yearly growth rate of prices. So when you have a temporary decline in something, you have something that we call base effect. This is gone, so I'm not going to talk about that. The second point, it goes back to the first part of my presentation, is, is there some slack left on the employment market? That's also something that could keep wages done. Uh, once again, I think this is not the case, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a question that is debatable. The third point I will, uh, I will discuss that further is also what we call the Phillips curve, which is the relationship between wages and, uh, and, and inflation unemployment rate and inflation. Uh, we have some reason to think that today the relationship has changed, uh, could impact also uh, the relationship between the labor market and prices. And also the, the last point is also a point of um, uh, pricing power, uh, which is uh, an important topic. Uh, are companies, have companies less pricing power today? So just this is just another slide on, uh, on uh, how we had full employment or not, so I'm not going to here, I'm, not, I'm going to skip that. But once again, if you think there is some slack left, then it's, uh, you can think that uh, wages are not, will not accelerate too much as long as we are not at full employment. So that's, that's one point. Um, here, this chart is just showing the evolution of the relationship between core inflation and the unemployment rate. So you can see that in the past, you have an inverse relationship. When the unemployment rate is low, uh, core inflation is higher. Uh, where you can see that how this relationship has changed over time. It's now pretty much flat, meaning that for the same decline in the unemployment rate, you get much less increase in consumer prices. So why is that factor that could explain that? So I will come first with the French answers. It's because you have no unions now. You have no strike in the US. So this is a union membership. You know, Julien almost missed his plane because there was a strike in France. Uh, so the union membership rate has declined, meaning that the bargaining power of, uh, of uh, employees has also declined. Uh, Another story could be that you have more robots in the US, so it makes your bargaining power less, uh, less important. And also you have this uh, outsourcing story, the polarization of the labor market. A very compelling story to explain why wages are not reacting much to the decline in the unemployment rate is that when you look at wages, usually you look at the average of wages. 
And what's going on in the US is that you have a polarization of the labor market. You replace middle class workers that are retiring by either very low skilled jobs, a lot of low skilled jobs, or very high skilled jobs. And on average, if you, of course, if you replace middle class jobs by low skilled jobs, such as in resta restaurants, uh, truck drivers, uh, it pulls down the average of wages. It art artificially makes the average of, of wages lower. So that's, for me, a very compelling story. Um, another reason why we don't have higher wages in the U.S. is because you don't have a lot of productivity gain. There's usually a positive relationship between both. And also, that's my, now turning to my uh, f first set of explanation, explanation, is that the link between, uh, even though you have higher wages or higher, uh, higher costs right now for corporates, it's harder for businesses to, uh, to increase their consumer prices. For me, it's very impressive. You see, for example, the cost, the import prices, they've gone up quite sharply, but there's a disconnect between import prices and consumer prices. Thinking about Walmart also, and the competition between Amazon and Walmart in the retail industry, it's very hard to increase. Now it's much harder to increase the consumer, uh, consumer prices. So the pricing power of the pricing power of uh, corporates, of uh, producers, has declined. There's been a transfer of pricing power from the producers to the retailers. And that could be a reason why the price of goods is still declining. When you think about infl inflation, split it in two parts. The first part, you need to look at. I'm talking about core inflation here, because, OK, split it in three parts. You have energy prices, that's the volatility. Of course, if you, you see a continued increase in energy prices, then this is pull inflation. This will pull inflation upward. Uh, we don't think there is a lot of upside on oil prices, so I would, I would disagree with you here as well on the question you ask, uh, because most of the people say that uh, oil prices will keep increasing further. I think there's a huge political premium in there, but if you look at fundamentals, there should be a bit lower oil prices. Um, we know also there is a the willingness from the Saudis to have a slightly higher prices, some, something between uh, 70 to 80 dollars, but, uh, but we don't think like we are at 77 dollars for the Brent, and think it's pretty high already. So there will be an impact from that on, on inflation, but the, what matters really it's the core inflation. And so core inflation is driven by two things. It's driven by the price of goods, which, is, which depends on global conditions, on the evolution of the FX. And you can see also that the chart on the left, uh, the gray line is the price of core goods. You can see that it's still declining, even though import prices have reponded. in. And on the right, you can see that this is the price of services that, is, that depends on domestic conditions and it's pretty much dri driven by wages. So since wage growth is not accelerating further, is not accelerating a lot in the US, it means that the price of, of, price, of services is not going up very, very fast. Um, it's consistent with, what you, with your answer. It means that um, uh, inflation will be higher this year, probably somewhere between 2 and 3%. So for the Fed, it's, it really means that inflation is higher, but inflation will not accelerate sharply. It will not get out of hand. So if you are a central banker, this is just the perfect world for you. You have inflation close to target, not a lot of inflationary pressure, strong growth environment. So what you do, you do uh, just what you've been doing for the past year. You keep tightening at a very gradual pace. And this is basically what the Fed is telling you, is that uh, we are looking at three, four hikes per year. On average, the tightening cycle in the past, I'm talking about that, but I, wa I was a teenager in the last uh, tightening cycle. A, a typical tightening cycle in the US is 200 basis points per year. Here, we're talking about 75 basis points per year of increase in rate. So it's a very modest uh, tightening cycle. Um, 
and the Fed is uh, is on on track to keep doing that. There's very um, it's funny because in since 2010, monetary policy used to be the only game in town, and now we've shift we shifted uh, uncertainty from monetary policy to maybe fiscal policy or trade policy, and uh, and uh, there's very little uncertainty in my mind on what the Fed will be doing for the rest of the year. We may have two or three more hikes. Uh, and with the continuation of the gradual normalization of the balance sheet. So if I, if I summarize, uh, if you need to uh, remember something, growth prospects are good in the US. Uh, we are looking at growth still above potential, accelerating. That's because the economy is doing well. And on top of that, you also have uh, uh, some form of fiscal stimulus. It's not only the tax cuts, but it's also the budget agreement. Inflation is not coming back. Inflation will be slightly higher, but not too much. So which means that the Fed will keep tightening at a, at a moderate pace. So we don't see this as a major risk for, for growth looking forward. Um, of course, thinking about the other risk, we're thinking about ge geopolitical risk are very important. And, uh, and, and trade risk, what's going on with uh, NAFTA, it seems that discussions are People are now positive about NAFTA. Most of the people think we're going to get a deal. If you would have asked the same question one year ago or six months ago, probably you would have a, a slightly different answer. So NAFTA is, going, is doing a, a bit better, but, uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainty with, on uh, trade with China. So that's pretty much it for me. And uh, I will... Uh, Give it to you. Well, thank you, Thomas. I'm just going to um, make a couple of points. Firstly, I'm going to make a prediction here that it, within 15 years, don't worry, Thomas, within 15 years, the um, education system in this country will change radically for the better for parents. That just happens to coincide with my, when my firstborn will be going to college, I hope. So maybe it's more of a full-on hope, but we shall see. Um, a couple of other things. Um, actually, I think you'd all agree that the most important part of the presentation was the fantastic use of data stream data, which is a great Thomson Reuters product. My masters will be pleased. Um, although we may have just sold it to Blackstone. I can't remember if I was going with the sale or not. Anyway, uh, what else was I thinking about? Ah, roboization of the economy. Maybe this is something for, for the Q&A session later. But how, I wonder how that fits in with edu education more broadly, actually, because we were looking at this a bit last year, and uh, one of my colleagues made the point, she admitted it was a bit of an old point, but the senator from the, from the state uh, says it's still the same, but back in the 80s, uh, government programs to retrain people was not, were not very good. For example, women who lost their factory jobs were retrained as hairdressers, which is really useful when you've got a nothing but hairdressers in a, in a town. Um, but the, the senator from that state, and I forget which state, I did spend two minutes trying to find out, said that things haven't changed much. And I think that's one of the bigger long-term risks I see to this and other economies is there's not a great deal of, of good evidence for retraining on a broad level, at a national level. Germany's kind of got it, but a lot of other countries don't. As, as we go more towards robotization, it, it sort of worries me. Um, one other thing, again, maybe for, um, or two other things, maybe for the Q&A, um, is it worth touching on whether 3 to 4% GDP growth is sustainable, as the Trump administration likes to say? And also, as, as we see more money coming into people's pockets, are Americans going to consume it or save it? Or Because in the past, until the financial crisis, they were, you were, should I say, pretty bad savers, and that improved after the crisis. I'm just wondering what happens there, but I think maybe that's for uh, the Q&A.